Hello and welcome to my channel. In this channel, we explain various nursing concepts in a simple form for better and easy understanding. These videos could be used by both LPN and RN students as well as nurses who are trying to refresh their basic concepts. My name is Nas Mosh. In this video, we're going to start talking about our electrolyte imbalance. And let's start with some housekeeping or definition. So our intracellular electrolytes involve or include potassium, phosphorus, and magnesium. Our extra electrolyte involve sodium, calcium, chloride, as well as bicarbonate. So what is the function of electrolytes? The function of electrolytes are a couple and they include a maintenance of homeostasis, our body homeostasis to keep our body in balance. It regulates the acid base balance. It maintains fluid volume as well as cardiac stability. It helps distribute water between fluid compartments. Remember, we talk about fluid and electrolyte movement and as well as promote neurocellular excitability. So let's start with our first electrolyte. And our first electrolyte is sodium. And the chemistry denotion of this is normally Na positive. All right. So when somebody is considered to have hyponatremia, means to have low sodium volume or low sodium level. And our normal levels for sodium are between 135 to 145. Causes of hyponatremia could include GI loss like vomiting, diarrhea, SIADH, adrenal insufficiency, which involves the RAS and AGH process that we talked about, water intoxication, which is overhydration, being in a NPO status, as well as excessive diaphoresis, which is sweating. Some medication also could induce hyponatremia where we are losing this water, right? So some of this uh, medication that could get you to have hyponatremia include diuretics, anticonvulsants, SSRIs, lithium, are some of the medication that could induce hyponatremia. Some signs and symptoms of hyponatremia include tachycardia, weight gain and edema, confusion, seizures, hypotension, muscle cramps and twitching, anorexia. Remember, anorexia is lack of appetite, right? But anorexia nervosa is the mental status diagnosis when people do not want to eat and then nausea and vomiting as well as weakness and lethargy so how do we treat these patients we need to replace that sodium we could either replace it orally via gi tube or even iv and hypertonic solution risk is you could end up with a cerebral edema and we need to watch for that, right? We don't want anybody ending up with cerebral edema. Then we'll, they'll have ICP, which is increased intracranial pressure, right? And could lead to brain damage. What do we do with this patient? We restrict oral fluid intake, right? We monitor I and O and daily weights. Remember, they have a lot of fluid in their body. And also some medications we could give them, right? Some hydrochloride. So let's talk about hypernatremia. This is when somebody has levels of sodium above 145. So hypernatremia could be caused by diabetes inhibitors. Check our endocrine video. We could also be a kidney failure, corticosteroids, hypoaldosteronism, dehydration, GI loss, hypotonic tube feedings, burns and heat strokes right these things are causing less of the water not to be there in your body and signs and symptoms of this include seizures tachycardia pulmonary edema hypertension hyperreflexia or twitching hallucinations fevers swollen dry mouth and sticky mucous membrane and how do we treat patients with hypernatremia patients with hypernatremia we actually treat them by monitoring their daily weights remember one thing whatever salt goes water follows we don't want them to get overhydrated because of the salt when we are trying to get them homeostasis we maintain seizure precautions because they are at risk for seizures we administer diuretics right iv 
hypotonics or isotonic solutions. We encourage increased oral intake, fluid intake, and we also educate them on sodium diet restrictions. Since they have so much sodium in their body, we want them to decrease that sodium intake. Okay. So let's talk about potassium and potassium levels are between 3.5 and 5, meaning low potassium is anything below 3.5. So hypokalemia, what are the causes of hypokalemia? We could have, it's normally blood, uh, body fluid loss, which could involve uh, vomiting, NG sectioning, kidney disease, dietary deficiency, alkalosis, and diarrhea. Also some medication adverse effects like corticosteroids, diuretics, digitalis, and Lasix. Like abuse of Lasix can end up a patient having hypokalemia as well. Some signs and symptoms of low potassium involve they'll have a flat or inverted T wave. Remember our EKG, QRST, the ventricles are psh, flashing out the blood, so it will be inverted. They will have a decreased bowel motility. They'll have nausea and vomiting, irritability, confusion, parenthesia, and some muscle weakness and cramping. Of course, dysrhythmias, right? Because potassium actually has effect to our cardiac function treatments so what how do we treat this patient we could treat them with medication and dietary resources we can administer and monitor potassium replacement orally and iv remember when we are replacing potassium this patient any patient with a potassium imbalance needs to be on a cardiac monitor because of the risk of dysrhythmias you could send a patient into a heart attack so monitor respirations, I and O, arterial blood gases, as well as we educate patients on the risk of hypo and hypokalemia. And we never administer potassium IV bolus. It must be diluted and no potassium is equals to no pain and no pain is equals to no potassium. When a patient does not urinate, we do not administer potassium. Why? If they can't flush this out, they're going to end up with hyperkalemia. That patient can end up having a very bad cardiac dysrhythmias. We could actually kill the patient. And I think some states, people who are sent on death row, that's how they actually terminate their life. So hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is anything about 5 potassium level and causes could be renal failure, adrenal insufficiency, our system, right? Acidosis and excessive potassium intake. And this is uh, potassium intake. Most salts, things that we use, salt replacements are high in potassium. So you need to watch that. So some medication that could cause this, our potassium sparing diuretics, because most of them are potassium wasting, but sprinolactin is potassium sparing. And remember, our ACE inhibitors, they increase the level of potassium in our body. What is our nursing care with this patient? Always, always have them on a cardiac monitor. We will have to monitor their ECG and our bowel sounds. We provide dietary education and Im implement restrictions. We'll place this patient on dialysis. We need to get it out. We'll give them some medication, some loop diuretics, some loop diuretics, which do not spare potassium to get it out. Calcium gluconate to bind it. Some 50% glucose with insulin because it helps bind that potassium out of the body. And some signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia involve what? Ventricular dysrhythmias. We're going to have increased bowel motility. We have that peak T wave on our ECG will have too much excitability. You know, you're going to be, the body is excited. We have muscle twitching, parenthesia that will be early, and then late will be ascending muscle weakness. You know, after so long, your body is too excited. What happens? It gets tired. So the excitability gets over. In our next video, we're going to start talking about our calcium as well as our magnesium electrolyte. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. See you on the next one. Bye.